just one more question. So we are still reviewing this if else. And this is just going to the, there was a question about this is going to the next line. So this is just a nicer printout. So this F printf. It just jumps to the next line. Slash N. Yes. So, can you, how, how would you uh, lose this? If you say uh, you put 1 to x is equal to 120, right? And then you have yes. to this script. How would you make an output, like a readable output in the command where x was changed into 150? So, you want to actually print x here? Like, like print, and, uh, the, yeah, an x. Here. Okay. So, if I wanted to print x here, then I would say something like that. Maybe let's print it here. How's that? Okay. So we'll print this one. Okay. And I'm going to say x equals to 1. So if I put it as a floating point, that's the, always the, the default number is a floating point number. X equals two is just the text, okay? Percent F. Yeah, I'm gonna type that into at least this piece in my lab right now. So let me just open diary. Okay. So basically, if I just said x is 20 and I wanted to print it, the formatted print is something like this. And I'm going to put go to the next line so it looks a little neater. And x. So this is the simplest print ever. And this is what it does. And you can modify this in various ways. So I could say, aha, uh -huh, just leave only two decimal points. And two is just random there to accommodate any size of a number. So then it's just cutting to, down to two decimal points. I could have really had 2.2. It's before and after point, how many spots do we? Oh. Now, even if I said one, it would still fit 20 in there. So technically, it's still going to do the right thing, even if you have a, a number larger than what you left the space for. Right? So 20 actually has 2.2 2 digits before the point. It's still going to execute fine. The key is limiting this to two spaces after decimal point. So there's certain default behavior that still saves you. Yes? That's precisely. So what happens if I don't put this is what happens. So it doesn't print anything before it actually puts this command line being sign. Okay? So this is why I'm adding slash n, because otherwise I have everything bunched up together. It's not wrong, it's ugly. Yes? So when, it, when you do the f and f and it's like x equals, is that just like a syntax? That's a format, yes. Okay. So x equals 2 is just text. Okay? I could have done whatever, I could have put Masha, okay? okay? But the number actually requires a format to be interpreted as a number. Okay. So it's going to get grab that number and put it in the format. I could have put, if I just do integer format, it's going to write it as integer. 
without any decimal places. Okay? So it's up to you. There's also G. G is gonna either, this actually works better for something of this sort, or no, that's actually, let's do something like this. And E. So if you put E as a format, it's going to put it in scientific format. And G will kind of pick the better looking between F and B. <laughs> so if it's an integer, it's going to show it as an integer. Otherwise, it's going to show the real number. Okay, so this is just a quick review on fprintf. It's a common command for any kind of, so typically in functions, I want to return the user certain data, but that data typically has to be printed to the user so that user knows what actually happened in the function. So fprintf is one of the very common output commands. Next thing that I introduced last time was loops, and just like doing loops, when you go running, it's basically repeating things over and over again. Okay. And basically the way they're implemented is you either say for index equals to some expression, and this expression evaluates to a vector of values, whatever those values might be. Okay. And then you will do something for every index. An index is something that is changing. You could also, and we're going to introduce this like a, a, a little later today, while something is secure, there will be a relationship. While something is true, keep doing a block of statements. And when that something stops being true, then you stop coming without a loop. Okay? So these are the two types of loops. So let's see the for loop first. Okay. And I may as well just do this example in MATLAB. So for for loop, very simple, let's say that x is now just an array, and I'm just going to say lin space between two values, I'm just going to go 50 and give me 200 values. So that's obviously something, so equally spaced points, 200 of them between 0 and 50. And let's say that I want to sum them up, okay? Logically, what am I going to do? If I was doing things on the paper, I would start with x of 1, then I would add x of 2 to it, then x of 3, and I would keep going, right? So this sum, I'm going to call it s, so this is my x of 1, right? x of 2, and so forth. So I would just say x of 1 plus x of 2 plus x of 3 <coughs> plus, and so forth. The problem is I don't want to keep typing here this 200 of these elements, right? So this is where for loop saves me the trouble. So I can either start my sum with x of 1 or I can simply start it with zero and keep adding stuff to it. Okay? So first, first thing that you have to do for these loops, you have to initiate whatever it is that you're summing. Okay? So basically, I'm going to initiate sum s is equal to zero. So initialization is very important. I'm actually going so important that I'm going to So initialize the sum. You cannot start with empty memory. Even if your mind starts with, oh, it's just zero, you should be able to conceptualize that. But a computer cannot conceptualize. You've got to tell it what to do every, every single bit of it. So initialize the sum. And now just repeat this, like keep adding elements of x to that sum. So I'm going to say for index, and I'm going to call index i is equal to 1, 2, how many? How many points do I have in x? 
200, so I can just do this, okay? And I'm going to add this sum. I'm just going to keep adding to it. So I'm going to say sum is equal to whatever I had in the sum before plus this new element x of i. Okay. And that's it. End. So at every step, I'm going to take my old sum, increment it, and replace my old sum with this new value. Is the logic clear? That's essentially it. So what is my sum? Okay. Let me quickly check. There is actually a built-in function, sum of x. OK. In this case, I was able to double check myself against the built-in function. You don't always have that. If I didn't have this built-in function to double check, then I would create something simpler. I would create x as. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Okay, and just to, for kicks, I'm, I would do this to make it a little different. Okay? So what is the sum I need to get? 1 minus 2. The total is 3. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So let's do... So I'm just going to repeat. And now it's not 200. It's actually five of them. But to actually be completely independent of what is the size of my current vector, I'm just going to use the function numel of x. That's number of elements in x. Very useful. So that way, no matter which x I come up with, it's going to evaluate it correctly. If I left 200, the program would yell at me because I don't have 200. You can try that out just to see how it's going to yell at you. It's useful to know what messages it's giving back so that you know to correct them later. Yes? So, um, num L, that's just a function of time. That's a function in MATLAB that gives you a number of elements in the array. Very useful. So that way you can write programs that are a little more independent. So every, every new thing you come up with, it's going to execute correctly. So what is my S? Oh, wow. What happened here? 5,003. Why? I didn't initialize to the correct values. This is the importance of the initialize. It's just going to keep doing. Bear in mind, computer is only doing what you're telling it to, and not more. So I did not set the sum to zero, so I need to redo that. Okay. Now, let's do a very quick motiv mo modification of this, and I want you to actually open whoops open a new file and make it a function and let's solve this first problem write the function sum square dot m that takes vector x as an input and returns the following sum sum of i is equal to n and n is size of x okay of squares so this, is everybody familiar with this sum? This is a sum that goes from i is equal to n of x of i square. So this is essentially x of 1 square plus x of 2 square plus x of 3 square and keep going until the x of n square. Okay, That's what this is a shorthand notation for. 
Similarly, if you had this large, this is a, this is a Greek letter sigma, uppercase <laughs> sigma. There's a lowercase sigma and uppercase sigma. This is an uppercase P, okay, Greek letter. So again, this is a product, okay? So I could do a product of these. So why don't you solve this first problem? Just simply modification of what we just did right now. So we were typing in these sums, so just make it as a special function. So open a new function, give it a name. And now that I dis discovered this display, I'm going to do, do it too, but I'm not going to show you. So here is this playback. So I want the function sum squared on m. So input variable is what? What's an output variable? This sum that I compute, so s or whatever you call it. So it has to be, uh, sum is a bad name because there is actually a function called sums. It could work, but it can mess things up. Summa. Summa is sum in Croatian, by the way. Oh, really? Yes, it is. Oh. So summa. Double M or is it Just A at the end. Summa. Okay. Summa is female for some reason in the Croatian language. Also? Croatian has grammar, grammatical. Right. Yeah, so you're female or male grammatically for whatever reason. Summa is female. Oh. And chair is male. And yeah, things like that. No, chair is female, table is male. Okay. Grammatical, and you kind of have to know it to know the endings, which is bordersome for people learning the language. So it's Same in German and French, German, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I have function, and then I need output parameter s equals to some square of x. That's my first line in function script, right? Are we getting there? I'm not going to show. Solution is hiding behind here. So all I really need is to that stuff that I was typing into command line, I just need that function preamble and save it. 
and then whatever x I define. So here is the solution. Function s equals the sum square of x. So x is my input. So this is how to make it pretty. I will have a comment line. So x is input array. And s is sum, sum of squares of x, its output. So here is an example preamble. I need to initialize my s just a second. So just like I did, I need to initialize my s. And th this is the only difference really, right? I'm sparing them now. Question? Whatever is outside of the function is not going to affect function unless it's passed as an input parameter. So if you initialize s outside, function doesn't know about the outside s. Okay? It's creating it in its own little world. It's creating all new variables here and then cleaning them up. There is no s once I clean it up. Okay. This is a great point. Let's actually, so I'm just now going to clear all. And I'm going to get give myself an x again. Okay. So if I, again, if I know some square of x, so this is an answer. This is actually the output. But I don't have it saved it in my memory. This answer is the automated MATLAB thing that's going to get overwritten the moment I type in something else. So in order to record what's coming out of the function, I actually have to say s is equal to. And that way I will remember what s is and I can use it. Okay. Now, I don't have to call it s. Most of the time, you don't even know what is how is function programmed. You can call it something else. You can say square sum. OK? Now, this is recorded as 55. What is s? s. After I executed the function. doesn't exist anymore after I execute the function. Okay. So s that existed within the function is not defined outside of the function. So once function is over, that's cleaned up. What happens in Vegas stays there. Okay. So you have to distinguish between the variables that you are using in your workspace and those that are in the function. The only stuff going into the function, or the only thing that function knows from the outside is the input parameters. The only thing that outside knows about stuff going in the function is the output variables, and only if you actually record them. You don't have to, in which case they're gone. Okay. So you don't have to write the sum square sum equals to sum square of x, but in that case, you will not have that number recorded, the sum, the sum that you were actually computed. I have a question. Yes.
that whatever is I'm doing here, I'm passing it outside. Okay? So that is up there has to exist in the body of the function. And that's actually a good point that I haven't thought about. I'm so used to it that I haven't thought about it. So basically, he's wondering, well, why do I have to repeat this? You don't have to, but then you cannot pass the output out. So up there, you're going to repeat things that you already defined here and compute somehow. Okay? And you're just going to tell function, do not delete S, pass it to the outside. Okay? So it's not defining it in any way. Actually, if you, if you don't have S defined here, it's going to yell at you. Okay. So you have to have S defined in the body of the function. And then you pass it to the outside. Okay? All right. Any other questions? Are we clear about what is input, output of a function, how to write one, and this especially the top part function? Output parameters equals to main. Okay. Is this a correct name of a function? No. no. Okay. Also, it's not all right to start with weird stuff. Okay? So just use words. Use your words. That's what I keep telling my children. <laughs> Go back to your childhood. <laughs> use your words. Okay. All right. Now, we don't have to do just one loop. So there is a smaller example here. We're fine with examples. This is just simply displaying whatever it is that you define. So point is that you can define you can define this vector of values to go through any way you can define a vector of values, okay? So in this particular case, okay, between 0 and pi, give me this vector of values that are all sp spaced by pi divided by 15. So however you would actually define this vector here, those, those could be your looping parameters, so to speak. So whatever it is, you can execute this if you'd like. Now, I could also nest loops inside loops, in which case, for every index of the outside loop, I'm going to execute the inside loop entirely. And then for the new index of the outside loop, I'm going to execute this second loop entirely again. So let's see this example. Okay. And I'm going to explain it first, and then I'm going to write. And this is helpful for multidimensional arrays, of course, matrices being the simplest ones we're working on. So let's say that you have some matrix A, and we're going to define ourselves one in a second. Then basically assume that its size are, sizes are n and m. Okay. Then if I say for i is equal to 1 through n, so this is number of rows. So this is executing something for every row. Okay, and then for j is equal to 1 through m, okay, so this is executing for all of the possible, no, this is actually for all of the number of rows, number of columns, so this is for all of the columns, okay, then I could for possibly say, aha, uh -huh, define a new matrix B, say that it's the first two times corresponding element of A plus 1, okay, and end. Let's try to execute this and see what happens. I'm going to create myself a new script. And first in that script, I'm going to define A. One, two. I'm going to be really imaginative here. Four, five, six. How's that? So this is double loop. Yes. If you want to, you can type things into command line, but it is a little better if you do the separate script. 
then you don't have to retype. So my size of A is what? Oh, undefined. I didn't execute it yet. Okay, run. Okay. So I'm going to test that size of A is 2 by 3, right? I'm actually going to call this M and, well, it doesn't matter. Is my size of A. So basically, N is number of rows, N is number of columns. So I'm basically just assigning <coughs> n to be my number of rows, in this case 2, and n to be number of columns, in this case 3, just to have a little more general code. So now I'm going to do a loop for i equals to 1 through n. Whoops. And when you're typing code, you first type in this first loop and just give it the limits. You have to end the loop with n. And now I'm going to do something or execute something for every element i. Yes? You can if your loop is infinite and doesn't stop. It's not going to crash if you keep running. Control D. Or close math. Which is why diaries are good. You can go back, pick up the, and which is why also writing scripts is good. If you save the script, you're still gonna find it when you reopen. Okay? So that's this part of good practice. So for i is equal to one to n, and basically I'm just gonna actually first I'm just gonna say f print f i equals just to see what's happening. So I'm just going to print i every time it enters the loop, just to see how it happens. So this is just printing my i, current i, current index. And now I'm going to do the second loop, and that second loop, so I have how many? I have i is equal to 1 and i is equal to 2, so those are my first and second row. Now I actually want to go element by element in each row. And the way I will do that is that I will say for j is equal to 1 through m, okay? Do something. And that something is define a new matrix that is simply 2 times a of ij plus 1. So I have a nested loop, and I'm going to print j's as well, just to um, see that it executed something, j is equal to, but I'm just going to give it um, space <laughs> instead of new line, so it's going to go into a new line only when it's printing i. And I'm going to say b of ij is equal to, or a of ij for, no, I'm just going to leave it at j for now. So this is just checking what is, the, what is it doing. It's going to execute this, run, or I can execute it by typing double loop. looks that in my formatting it would have been a little better to type in something like this. So let's do again. Okay. So for i is equal to 1, I'm going to execute j1, 2, 3. So I'm going down the row. Okay. Then for i 
y is equal to 2, I'm executing 1, 2, 3, j, 1, 2, 3 again down that row. Okay? So I'm accessing elements 1, 1, 1, 2, 1, 3, then 2, 1, 2, 2, 2, 3. Okay? That's clear? And my b is 3, 5, 7, 9, 11, and 13. It did compute b in the process. So it first computed this element, then this element, then this element for i is equal to 1, okay? For i is equal to 1, it's going to go into this loop and go down this line and compute b, okay? So b is 2 times 1 plus 1 is 3, 2 times 2 plus 1 is 5, and 2 times 3 plus 1 is 7, okay? Then this loop ends... So after the sec this J loop ends, it's going to go into I loop again, okay? And for I is equal to 2, it's going to execute this loop again. So it's going to print this, and indeed it did that, I is equal to 2, and then it computed B of 2, 1, B of 2, 2, B of th 2, 3, okay? And then it would like to go again into the I loop, but we are done because I loop went from one to two, and we're done. Yes. Times a plus one. It could have worked. This is actually so. What I'm showing you here is what MATLAB does behind the scenes when you type in this. So his question is, in terms of this was just a scalar multiplication, so I can just do this. Okay? And it does work. So this is, this is what MATLAB does behind the scene. And you need to know that for cases where MATLAB doesn't allow you to do something. Okay? 